Today, I'm in Sydney, Australia, hosting a whole series of chats in cooperation with Notbound, an Australian charity that's working with the chats, enabling this to happen. Today, I welcome Gary Kennedy to the Fireside Chat series. Gary, welcome and thank you. Good day, as we say down here. <laughs> yes, I'd also like to extend sincere thanks to our host facility here, which is the iconic Stonewall Hotel on Oxford Street in Sydney. So let's start right at the very beginning. Gary, please tell me about your growing up, where you're from, a bit about your family. I'm one of the few people from Sydney who actually grew up in Sydney. I grew up a few kilometres from here in a place called Maroubra, which is a okay. surfside suburb. As Sydney oh. is a, has some beachside suburbs. My parents met while surfing. Oh my gosh. Um, so they were very cool, like Annette Funicello, Frankie Avalon. <laughs> cool. They went surfing in their leathers on their motorbike. Um, so we moved around a lot when I was a kid. My father was in the army. Oh, okay. Um, and so life was moving about a lot. Uh, new schools every few years. So it wasn't until I was in my teens that we sort of settled down, lived in one house. Where all did you live? Um, in various army camps around Australia, but also two okay. years in Malaysia, in an army camp in Malaysia. Where in Malaysia? A place called Malacca. In fact, a base called Terendak, just outside Malacca. Huh, okay, I'm not familiar with it. Somewhere around Kuala Lumpur or Johor? No, it's, or? Uh, it's two thirds of the way down the bottom on the west coast. Hmm, okay. I've only been to basically that one part of Malaysia. I haven't been to the rest of the country. So It, it was eye-opening for someone who came out of, you know, white, poor, and we were poor. Um, uh, I was in the army. So yeah. the areas and going over and experiencing foreign cultures. First time I'd ever seen people who were Chinese or Indian background. How do you feel that impacted you in life? Uh, a couple of things. One of them, looking back, there's certainly the army thing brings the military discipline uniform thing in fairly quickly. I mean, I was in army schools. We did marching practice. Oh, wow. Um, we used to wear full uniform. There were full military ceremonies held for British and Australian uh, military things. So I had a sort of a military upbringing. Wearing a full uniform was not unusual. Um, we had Christmas parties in military camps where you went riding in armored personnel carriers or flew in helicopters. Um, that was wow. just what happened. I was sort of, I think the American expression is an army brat. Ah. So who was Captain Scarlet? Captain Scarlet was my childhood hero. Um, look, I was asked a question, where did you first get an interest in leather and uniforms? And I sort of came into the leather scene via the uniform thing. Sure. But partly because it was cheaper. Um, but p uniform was a way of both fitting in and standing out at the same time. In a room where everyone was in black leather, Sure. You walked in and you're wearing oh, you know, the fireman shirt I have on now. You fit in, but at the same time you're different. But when I was asked, how, where did this first come from? I remember, what, what was my earliest childhood fondness? And it was a, what you would now call anime. The, okay. This is a, a group, if people know the Thunderbirds, yes. this, this is from the same studio that did the Thunderbirds. And there was a guy called Captain Scarlet who was indestructible. And... He had a five o'clock shadow, and looking back at how he's dressed now, and this is a puppet, but he's wearing knee-high black leather boots, he's wearing jumpers, he's wearing a red vest with zips, and he's wearing a peaked hat with a microphone and a five o'clock shadow. And looking back at it now, I thought, hmm, <laughs> I, I can see where part of this may have come from. And in fact, I've actually had that outfit made and worn that outfit out. Why aren't you wearing it today? Oh in a cupboard somewhere oh. with, with all the other outfits. Wow. So, so going way back, my first, I suppose my first childhood hero, if you can think back from TV, uh, was could have walked straight into a leather bar without a problem at all, or my straight gosh. into the Mardi Gras party here. It's, it's sort of, you know, full fetish outfit, except it happened to be on the childhood puppet on a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned, though, a moment ago that you really came out first through the uniform fetish issues. Is there anything in that arena that was particularly 
uh, enlightening to you, something that particularly do turned you, you on? Do you know, I think, well, partly yes, yeah. Um, okay. The, the, for one of the best, do we knit while well, the clothes are still on has always appealed to me. Okay, and okay. Then, uh, and it still does. Um, so that's got a certain appeal. Um, I suppose it could be going back to the military thing, growing up as yes. an army brat, that yes. certainly had an effect. Uh, I suppose the other thing about the, the uniform thing was it was available and was able to be individualised quite simply. Yes. Um, I do travel as part of my job and you could pick up, you know, the fireman shirt for interstate or uh, the security guard's outfit and you could very quickly individually tailor it. I know when I went to IML, I made sure I took the obviously Australian sure. shirts so it was instantly obvious that I was a tourist, and it worked quite well. <laughs> but when you were when you were young, when you were traveling around and you were and you were living in these various places, did this fetish begin to evolve for you at all? Then no, no, I was a late bloomer. Um, okay. It, in fact, I'm one of those people who is so unsure of everything. I'm in the military camp. You're not out in the mm -hmm. military camp. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was so unsure. I knew there was something different, didn't know what that was. So there was nothing for a while. And okay. then when it did come out, it all came out, <laughs> so to speak. I do remember a famous party in Sydney called Inquisition, okay. um, which... I ended up running that party many years later, and I remember walking into that party when it was number two and having an epiphany and thinking, oh, this is it, this is my group. Um, I'm in with the, well, I remember thinking at the time, the, you know, I'm in with the weird freaky people, but I thought, mm -hmm. ah, but that makes me one of the weird <laughs> freaky people, and I, I had no problem with it. It was sort of a discovery of where I fitted in. But let's take a step back so we can understand a little bit more about you. You said that you were very nerdy in high school. Yeah, I and was. How did you fit in with that? Um, I was in the debating team. Um, I didn't do any sport at all except swimming, um, which over here is a fairly popular sport. Um, I, I was not at, both my parents were athletic, both my brothers were athletic, I wasn't. Um, I did Latin, I topped the science class, I was ducks of my year, I was extremely nerdy. Um, okay. And I still know nerdy people. All, all those stereotypes on the TV program, The Big Bang Theory, I know all those people. Those stereotypes are true. And I still mix with science groups, so I was extremely nerdy. Um, and looking back, the other gay people were nerdy as well. Uh. It's sort of... There's a little, without even realizing you're in a clique, we were in our own little clique. But you came out a little later in life. You alluded to that a moment ago. Why yeah, did, I, I really why didn't later? Out, I suppose, uh, literally late bloom, a puberty didn't kick him. I didn't show till I was 18. Oh my gosh. So, so there, okay. there's that element. I do remember growing taller while I was at university. It really, I think the thing that did it was I, there were two things. I basically finished high school and still was very nerdy and introverted. Then I had two things happen at the same time. Um, I, because my school is a surfing school that does rugby unions, so I just did not fit in at all. So I had two things happen in my life simultaneously. One is I went to university and instantly I'm mixing with, for want of a better term, a group of nerdy people. Okay. So I've suddenly found a group of people I'm in common with at the same time I discovered uh, going to Rocky Horror on Friday night. So I'm one of the people who did the dress-ups on Friday night. So I simultaneously found two groups of people, both quite different, who fitted both sides of my personality. So almost within a month of finishing high school, I virtually never saw anyone from high school ever again. Um, I've, I've had n n There's only one person I still know from high school Effectively, I thought, well, there's a part of my life I didn't like, get rid of it. Yeah. And instantly yeah. found both the Rocky Horror and the university crowd who both sides of my personality match. And even in the nerdy university people, there were people there in cool indie bands. There was an open lesbian. So even amongst the nerdy people, you know, they all assumed I was gay. Even if I wasn't out, they just assumed I've got the right mannerisms for it. I had no girlfriend, so yeah. I had the, the facial hair. They just assumed correctly. So 
there was just two groups of people I instantly fitted in with back when I was about 18. But you came out a little bit late. So what, what finally prompted you to take that step? I suppose I was just over not being out, if that made sense. So, you know, that living, in, there was the living in the closet bit mm -hmm. where I was just, I didn't ever officially come out where, you know, hi world, I'm here. I just, and I wouldn't say I ever denied it. Uh, when people used to say, why aren't you married? I used to say, it's because I haven't found the woman I want to marry yet, which is still accurate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there was a point at which, when if anyone asked, I just said yes. Um, but that wasn't until I was about 30. And it was, I suppose the big coming out for me was, um, I entered the Mardi Gras parade um, in Sydney, which listeners of this have probably known, it's fairly famous around the world, one of the bigger parades. And back then it was still the, the nerdier part, so I, first time in the parade, so I put in full articulated semi-trailer, rigged it full of full disco rig, choreographed Abba's Mamma Mia as a rig, so the leather thing hadn't quite kicked in fully, leather on the weekend, or an Abba at other times, and did the full dance routine. So that was my first official coming out, was um, organising a full Mardi Gras float with camera crew. That, that's quite an ambitious step for someone who's not otherwise out. Yes, yes. This is, I suppose, the two sides of my personality. It was still full dress up. I was just in white okay. rather than in black. Yeah, it was, I suppose I was just a bit over living my life the way I was living it, where I was effectively, for one of us, living in the closet, but not really. I wasn't denying it or anything, but I thought, oh, I'm just fed up with this. No, <laughs> just, you know, you, you're this way, just, you know, you know born this way, as that thing that Gaga would see. Basically, I was just over not being me. So I just, both sides of the personality both came out, and they were both incredibly over-the-top versions of me. I have found the uniform thing to be a, a great way. I'm really quite shy. I mean, I'm really quite nerdy and shy. I still am. Or at least I think I am. Most people don't, but I think I am. Um, and the uniform thing was a great way, like the leather is, where you can be you, but you're still someone different. Right. So it was a way of being someone else. And when I'm in the uniform, um, I was quite extrovert. I had no problem, you know. I quite famously once, after one of the dance parties in Sydney, I'm in full New South Wales policeman's outfit. Totally illegal. Uh, fully oh. badged everything. It's arrestable here. And we were coming out of a dance party and they had shut the streets down for the Sydney Olympic Games for the marathon. And here's the whole group of leather people. And I just thought, oh, I'm just over this. So I walked out into the middle of the marathon in police and just stopped. And, <laughs> and pushed the leather crowd through. And I thought, you could get arrested for oh that. Oh, my it's, God. It's the sort of thing when you're in the uniform, yeah. you take on a different persona. Well, how were you introduced to sort of the leather kink scene? Uh, I suppose, look, Rocky Horror didn't hurt. Um, there were certainly people in the leather fetish community I met from Rocky Horror. Okay. Uh, and the fetish scene is definitely alive there. In fact, I still know quite a few people from Friday nights at Rocky, who I met in the line at the movies, uh, ah. who are very big in the <laughs> fetish scene still these days. Um, I suppose it was in terms of there wasn't really, hi, I'm here. It was basically going to the bars and meeting people. Um, and running across other people who were in the same scene. So you, you meet one or two people and go with them to other things. It was a gradual thing. Well, tell us about the, the Sydney leather scene that you discovered at that time. It, it was not quite underground, but it certainly wasn't as public as it became. It was still, well, this is pre-internet, this sure. is pre-mobile phone, yeah. um, this is pre-grinder, well back then. Uh, you, you know, we still the, looked at personal ads in the back of the newspaper to find trade, that sort of thing. Yeah. So it was, I suppose going back then, it was finding your way through and finding, finding various other people in the scene was, was how initially I got involved. Well, what bars were available then that are gone now that, that would be nostalgic for people to remember? Look, I remember the very first time I ever went to a leather bar, mm -hmm. uh, which is a bar called 
back then would be called the keep okay. um, underneath a bar in Surrey Hills called the Clock Hotel and um, I took a friend of mine almost the only other gay person I knew um, and he was a long haired Greek motorcycle rider Wow! and I said we're going to a leather bar because he'd always wanted to go and he went and he was quite scared he said what will I wear I said wear your motorbike gear for God's sake and I went along in the Queensland policeman's outfit and we just blended in but I remember thinking ooh 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 it's just like the Al Pacino movie when we, uh, when we saw uh, it just uh, like uh, cruising I suppose that was my first ever time to a bar uh, to a leather bar and after that it was just back then you just went regularly so semi-regularly you would just go out now was there anything in the bar that was surprising to you shocking to you can I say no okay, no, okay. Um, because unlike places overseas uh, back rooms didn't really exist in Australia okay that was all illegal back okay. then in fact okay. being gay was illegal when I first started if you like mm -hmm. I was still 14 years in prison here until the 1980s so we didn't really have the backroom scene that you sometimes get in, particularly in Europe, but sometimes in America as well. Um, certainly coming to Europe was enlightening in terms of what you saw happen in the bars there. But seeing what we saw in the bars, I suppose if I'm, I was going to, I knew a bit about it because of my background with friends and had been to bars, but going in and seeing that, I suppose it was what I expected if okay. they make, if if rather than surprising me, it ticked the boxes as to what I thought it should be. Now, if I had gone in and there had been forty men in board shorts and singlets, I thought it would have been very disappointed. Sure. Or, or sure. similarly, not that you know, not there's anything, not that there's anything wrong with that. But if it had been men in drag, I equally would have been disappointed. Walking into a leather bar and it was a leather bar. Yeah. It was exactly what I wanted and exactly what I expected. So where did the people play? Were there private play parties in yeah, homes? Private, and... private play parties, small okay. parties. There were a couple of motorbike clubs around at the time and certainly a couple of them organized play parties as well. Which, which clubs were there? Do you uh, remember? Yeah, the South Pacific Motorcycle Club, okay. uh, which is probably the first one. Uh, the Dolphins Motorcycle Club was sort of formed out of that. They both okay. had parties. Um, the Hellfire Club started up while this was going on, if you like, the more straight, fetish, queer yeah. group were there rather than the gay group. Um, Dykes on Bikes had started up for the okay. girls. So there were a number of organisations who sort of started up around the same time. Are those particularly, you, you said the South Pacific Motorcycle, Motorcycle Club, Club and the Dolphins, are those groups even still in existence? South Pacific Motorcycle Club is long gone. I believe the oh, Dolphins okay. have also gone as well. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah. One of the problems that I suppose happened with the leather sea, which has happened, I gather, in a lot of places in the world, is um, it became popular. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, and when I say popular, it became a place for muscly boys to buy a harness and say they were into leather. Yes. Um, yes. And because the leather fetish scene was so perceived as uh, as inter well, interesting is not the word um, naughty yes. for want of yes. a better yes. term. Um, there were people who went, you know, people who went along to having no indication in any play at all who went to make up the numbers and so for a while it got quite a big scene and parties in Sydney would have 2,000, 3,000 people at a wow. party wow. Um, at a leather party of which probably one third of them were the leather scene and the rest were people who bought a ticket to go see the weird leather people and, yeah. and wear a harness for the night to look pretty. So, Gary, tell us, you, you mentioned earlier the Inquisition parties. What were those, or what are those? Tell us about that. Well, the Inquisition party was one of five big, you know, community gay and lesbian dance parties here, which probably the most famous is Mardi Gras. Okay. Um, there was a Pride New Year's Eve party, another good party called Sleaze Ball, which I, I did enjoy. Um, and Inquisition was one of those, and it basically, we could get 2,000 people to a leather party. And in the early days, uh, it used to sell that very quickly, so you had to know where to buy the tickets, because of course no online back then. Oh, right. So right. there were certain venues where there'd be huge queues outside to buy the tickets, but if you really knew, and you're in the scene, you knew the leather shops that were selling them 
that only uh-huh. sold to the leather community, uh-huh. so you could always get a ticket. Oh, okay. Um, and we'd get 1,500, 2,000 people to us. In fact, Inquisition 2 was the one that I sort of realised where I was in amongst my right element. You had your epiphany. I had my epiphany at Inquisition number 2. Um, but eventually when I joined the Leather Pride Committee um, around Inquisition 10, I volunteered for Inquisition 10. By then this is a bigger party, but he went now talking 3,500 people. Attending. What time frame were these happening? Uh, oddly, it used to happen around Mother's Day in Australia, so it used to happen in May. But what years was this? Oh, yeah. we're talking uh, 1980s, 1990s. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so late 80s, all of 1990s, they okay. finished oh, about 10 years ago. But you mentioned the Sydney Leather Pride Association. Take us to that. How did you come to be part of that? Uh, I suppose I came to it by accident. Um, I originally volunteered for something. Myself and my other half at the time volunteered for one of the Inquisition dance parties. Because okay. uh, my background, I own my own business and I've run conferences and conventions. And so okay. some people on the committee recognised that I had organisational skills. Uh-huh. Simply, simply because that's what I did for a living. And there's, as it happens on a lot of volunteer committees. There was an implosion and most of the people on the Leather Pride Committee left. Um, and so there were only a couple of people left, so I was asked to come onto the committee. And by Inquisition 12, where there were only four people on the committee, I actually ran the dance party that I'd volunteered at two years earlier. So it was a rather steep learning curve. Wow. What, what did you learn doing that? Um, well, for a start, it's the first time I... Because it's... And the first thing I learned is a dance party um, is a lot of organisation beforehand. Such as? Oh, such as um, I'm having to deal with um, insurance companies, uh, recording royalty organisations, the police. Um, I'm dealing with security guards. I'm hiring portable toilets. Wow. I'm talking with acrobats. I'm organising catering as well as running the party. We're talking full production. This is not just hiring a room for a backroom party. This is full. I've got concurrent DJs going for 10 hours in two and a half hour shifts um, and, and so on. So it's full organization, full running of a full event. But if you did this with only, what, two years experience, how in the world were you able to achieve that? I, I, there's, there's an expression, if you want to get something done, you give it to someone who's already too busy. And okay, I, well. I, and I suppose there was an element of that. It was either we had, there were only four of us organizing this in, and one of those was the treasurer, and one was a volunteer coordinator, and I'm given the job of organizing the party. So it was mm-hmm. either I did it or it didn't happen. And at that point, you know, I'm on the committee, I'm in the scene, and you know, you know, it's like you're you're on the committee. You don't want a personal failure in the leather scene, right? Um, and so we worked to get it done. Any problems or surprises, disappointments that came from any of this? Yeah, the venue wasn't the, the venue didn't work very well. Um, so I, in terms of that, it was a little overcrowded. We did have one interesting event. We had we're in a new place because the old place were in shutdown. Oh. We're in a new place and there were uh, supposedly fire alarms. And the idea is fire alarms come on, lights are supposed to come out, doors are supposed to open and all of that. Um, smoke machine set off the fire alarms. Oh my gosh. So, except there was a failure of the system. So no lights came on and no doors opened, which is good. Mm -hmm. So, in the middle of this dance set with lights, you suddenly hear, evacuate the building. And everyone thought it was a sample. Wow. And so they came. And then we had a fire crew come through the dance party. And thought, what a great show. My gosh. So, it's one of the best accidental shows I've ever had. What did the fire crew have to say about it? I think they were pretty freaked out because they're in the middle of a leather dance party. Uh, they, were, they were okay with it. They just went out and they checked the systems and realised, oh, it's a false alarm, it's only a smoke machine. But it was, we got a free show that night. My gosh, that is amazing. Mm. But you, you've mentioned now several times in our discussion Mardi Gras. How did that begin and how were you involved with it? My, well, 
I can't say partly because I'm not out and partly because I'm still young and living at home, I'm not involved in the very first outbreak, you know, with the very, very oh, first okay. riot. Sure. Um, I'm still at high school here and I'm not exactly sure where my bread's buttered, to use an Australian expression, um, okay. at that stage. But I have friends who are in, in the first ever riot. Mardi Gras, well, it was still illegal in Australia to be gay. Um, it was 14 years in prison for consensual gay sex, even in your own home. Um, so it's still full illegal, let alone you know leather or fetish. And so in 19, uh, 1978, they decided to uh, have a parade down Oxford Street. Um, right out here? Right out here where we are now, mm -hmm. uh, where the Mardi Gras parade is still run. Um, and at the end of the parade, uh, the police bashed a whole lot of people, um, and their names were pu their names were published in the paper. Their names and occupations, um, and so people who were school teachers or in mm. government positions lost their jobs as a result. And that was the <coughs> first ever. So the first parade was basically a bunch of people walking down the street with a truck with the sound system on in the middle you know, in the late afternoon, um, and. From that there were riots, and then that's where the parade came from. So the parade over here, I, think, I suppose like the Stonewall riots, the first gay riots came out of a riot okay. in Sydney as well. This was the late 70s? Yes, the late 70s. Oh, okay, okay, so a little later than in some other places. Yeah, yeah. and it was still illegal to be gay in my home state in Sydney until uh, 1984. So they only repealed that law in 1984. Well, when we prepared for this, Chad, you mentioned that today's leather kink scene has reverted to circumstances from it's years gone, ago. It's gone back again. Tell us about that. What's going on? And because even I notice it coming here as a leather man. What's going on with the leather scene here? It basically has gone back underground again. If mm -hmm. you like, the people who joined the leather scene because it was cool or naughty have been there, done that and left. Um, a lot of people who got into leather because there was no other option. You know, effectively, if you go back to the 80s, there were only two gay people, drag and leather. And that, that was the two people knew. So we've also seen people who really have the leather mindset but they're now into fetish or kink yes. or, or they're in yes. the bears. Yes. A lot of them, you know, you go to see the Mardi Gras parade with the bears and half of them are in chaps and harness. Sure. So I suppose we've seen people become more confident that leather doesn't have to be leather. Um, leather's, that old leather is a mindset, leather's not a look. And so a number of people who are still in the scene, and if there was a leather bar would be there, you now see in other parts of the community as well. So where are they going, though? I mean, are people doing private things in their still, homes? Yeah, there's still okay. private parties. There's still okay. some small clubs that aren't licensed bars. So we really don't have a leather bar in Sydney anymore. There are leather nights. Okay. Um, some people in the leather scene have, you know, dirty Facebook-type groups. And so they'll contact people and say, we're all meeting for drinks in this pub. And so 40 or 50 people in full leather will turn up to a pub. Or they're still, you know, the social networks are still there. You still, there's a leather group still in the Mardi Gras parade. There's still leather parties run, but they're now smaller. And like the old days, you really have to know yeah. some, you really have to be, you need to get into the scene and be part of the scene to know where everything's happening. A little easier these days with the internet and Facebook than it used to be, but you, it's almost gone back to where it was where you need to know, find your way in. And once you're in there, it's all more dis I won't say discreet, because leather's never discreet. But there's, there's, it's, you have to find your way in and find your way through it a little harder than when it was really out there in the 1990s, when there were leather bars and bear bars going in Sydney. What would you say is the number of people participating in the Mardi Gras parade from the leather contingent? Uh, you get about 50 a year who are oh, in okay. the okay. leather group, but there's another 100 people riding motorbikes in full leathers. Okay. The, the bears will march 100 people and half the bears will be in leather. But when you say leather, are you in, is, is that all encompassing? Are you counting the fetish people, like the puppies? No, because the Just strictly the leather yeah, people? Yeah, the puppies will be another group. 
there will be a kink, you know, the, the queer group rather than strict gay male leather will be there. Dykes on bikes will have 200 bikes okay. ride in the parade. If you looked at the people who are wearing leather, who you think, oh yeah, yeah, they're in the leather scene, there would still be several hundred people. And even when you're looking at marching entries, you know, of you know the Asian marching boys, there'll be a couple wearing harnesses, and some of them will not be there. They were no, not wearing the harness because it's pretty. They're wearing the harness because they believe in the harness. So even in, you know, and when you see, you know, the gay dads, some of them will be in leather. Yeah. So I suppose if yeah. you like, it's moved out of being the leather scene where I won't say it's more mainstream, but people are more open in showing their kinky in yes. that parade yes. than yes. they used to be. Yes, yes. And yes. the fact that they're more open now being, you know, indigenous or a father or working for the fire brigade and being kinky means you don't have to march with the leather group anymore. Yes. Because yes. you can march in your own occupation or family group sure. and still express the fact that you're a kinky fucker. Well, tell us a, a bit about the Australian contest circuit. How different do you see that from other places? Well, we don't always have one. I suppose okay. it, I suppose is it. It isn't often we have a mm -hmm. Sydney Mr. Leather here. Uh, it has happened. Um, yes. In fact, it's happened on several times. It's been launched, goes for a few years, and dies again. If there's one thing, I suppose, that's different about Australia from being in Europe and America, and I've been to England and Paris, and I've been in America, we're a little more casual down here in terms of the seriousness that you take being president or okay. a minister community. So I know, for example, I was in Nashville at a conference um, and we went to the only leather bear bar there and they were having a night and I was there with the other half and we were just chatting and just anonymously, I mean, I'm in gear, but, and my other half mentioned to someone that I was the president of Leather Pride in Sydney and it was suddenly, oh my God, we have a president from another club here. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. That, wouldn't, that tends not to happen here. If you go over, have a chat sort of thing, where it, it's, it's at a higher level. Of, it's a bit more casual here. We like to think in Australia a bit more casual, and I suppose that goes in the, the, the president, Mr. Leather thing. People who compete are quite serious about it. Sure. But it's, it's not something where everyone thinks, right, in I want to be Mr. Leather in a couple of years' time or I will be president of an organisation. We take it a little more casually here. It's, it's while you're president, people will come up and talk to you where presidents of a leather club in America won't get spoken to unless someone asks permission to speak to them. Well, I, I think that depends, sure, yeah. sure. Certainly that's been my yeah. experience. Yeah. So over here it's a little more casual, if you like. I suppose yeah. it's a more reflex a more casual lifestyle down here. Okay. We don't take things quite as seriously here. At least we don't think we do. Well, <laughs> one thing I, I have heard about the scene here in Australia, and of course this is, you know, all over, is there's a lot of drug use in the community. How do you see that issue? Yeah, that's, that's, that's there. Um, when, when it's... I suppose one thing, look, uh, when we organised the dance parties, we all did senior first aid certificates, uh, where simply because of, I suppose, duty of care for members of our community, um, we ran full first aid crews, full medical, not just first aid, we had doctors and nurses, we had full medical crews. So, because it's going to happen at a dance party, sure. that people are going, and in fact, in the straight scene here, some laws are being changed at the moment, because we had six deaths from drugs at dance parties in Sydney in the last couple of years, not the gay ones. Uh, it's definitely there, and, you know, not, uh, I've lost a friend to crystal, uh, to yeah. ice. Yeah. Um, I, so... It definitely is there. It's definitely an element. There's a group of people who believe the only way to have sex is while you're, while you're high. There's a group of people who believe the only way to go to a dance party yeah. is to be high. Yeah. And, and high is not, you know, amyl and pot. These days it would be, you know, crystal and G. Yeah. 
the, the heavier things. But do you think that that is something that uh, has decimated your community? How do you see it in, as far as the success of the entire gay community here? I, I, I think it's a small fraction of people who... Okay. The, the, the one thing, with, can I say, having you know, gone to straight dance parties, the one thing the gays get better is they know what a recreational drug is, if you understand, where you can go out and if you want to, you want to you know, do a cone or a pipe or snort coke, um, you'll do it for the party. And yeah. then you'll come down again and you won't touch it again till the next time you want to party in six months to a year. And the gays get that better than the straights. Hmm. Okay. What are your thoughts, though, on mentoring? in the community. How is mentoring seen here in Australia? There's not a huge amount of it, to be honest. Okay. Um, it, it doesn't really happen as happens in Europe and America. Um, when, from traveling overseas and going overseas, certainly, you know, and it's not just daddy boy relationships either. There are elder members of the community who, oh my, I won't take younger members of the community under their wing, tends not to happen here. Um, Interesting. And I don't know if that's because we're smaller or more fragmented. I think that's an element of it. I also think it's part of this casual attitude we have where we don't take it seriously. I suppose when I was in the scene, I couldn't say there's anyone who really mentored me through it. I sort of stumbled my way through it uh, with other people who were stumbling at the same time. Is there a mentorship over here? Yeah, there are people who do it. Is it typical? No, I'd say it's, it's not typical. There are certainly people who have said to me, you don't know what effect you had on me when I was new to the scene, simply because, you know, you just talk to them or... Mm -hmm. You know, and I never took that as formal mentoring. Where mentoring, oh, I see okay. more as taking someone under your wing and, uh, you know, almost like a, a child. Okay. Um, I've never done that. But certainly, you know, anyone wanted to know about something, I've been quite happy to talk to them about it. What if someone were to approach you and say, Gary, I would really love for you to mentor me in the community? What would you do? Uh, Look, can I say I do it? I actually signed up to, there's a gay mentoring service, which is not the leather scene. Um, a group here where young people want to be formally mentored, and that has scholarships. I actually signed up to that as one of the mentors because it's all very vanilla and white collar, all the people involved in that. And what you need some filthy pig involved in that. Uh, and they're all, you know, with all respect, they're all IT professional, banking, and I'm not from that profession. So I thought, oh yeah, they need someone. So far though, they've not menteed me with anybody. Huh, interesting. Mm. So there, there is a mentor program here, a formal one with scholarships and everything, but um, it tends to be very vanilla. Okay. If someone said to me, would you mentor me? First, let's find out what they wanted. You know, is hmm. that professionally? Is that in life? Or is it in the scene? And ask what they wanted. But there have been people who have said to me, oh, you don't know how you helped me within the scene. When I didn't realise I was helping them. Because, you know, someone young comes up to you and say, can you teach me how to? You just do. But that's quite a compliment for someone to say that to you. Look, the nicest compliment I ever had was someone from the trans community who transitioned and said, uh, I want your moustache, yours is the... Yeah, when I think of moustaches I want, yours is the moustache I want. So that's a lovely compliment. Absolutely. And so that person, that's one of the people who said to me, you don't realise what an effect you had on me simply because you talked me through uh -huh. through the transition. So this is someone who not only transitioned F to M, but also transitioned vanilla to leather Okay. at the same time. So um, they said, oh, you don't realise just sitting down and having a chat to me, what an effect you have. So in that sense, is there a mentoring scene? Yeah, the, I okay. won't say this, the senior people in the committee are quite happy, or in the community, are happy to sit down and chat to people, but it's not as if I've ever formally taken someone on my wing and mentored them. Let, let's go to the topic that you've brought up now a couple of times and uh, that I think is absolutely vital for you to discuss with us today. And that is the fact that being gay used to be illegal, and it wasn't very long ago. 
Well, we've only passed marriage here two yeah. years ago. Well, the state's only a couple of years more. Yeah, yeah, you, you yeah. only just beat us. Um, yeah, look, being coming out of an army family um, and, you know, Catholic army mm -hmm. people, uh, to come out eventually, um, and I, officially I never did. I've never had the discussion with my father. Oh, my gosh. Um, we both know, and we, we both know we never want to have that discussion. So we're both cool with that. Um, but in terms of, of, of formally coming out and all of that, I've never really done it. Okay, but how, you, you mentioned it was 14 years imprisonment yes. for being gay. Ill, for being gay was illegal here. Right, right. So, you know, I wasn't celibate till they made it legal. It was, it was always a fear. Um, back in the, you know, I, I suppose I'm being flippant, but I remember in the 80s, because being gay was such a stereo, you know, such a bad stereotype, um, if you got bashed around here, um, Poofters deserve to be bashed. Okay. Yeah. And, and so you live with the fact, especially if you dressed up, you know, you in drag or leather, you came out of a club and got bashed, you were left in the street because poofters deserve that. We had a number of unsolved murders here of young gay people, including being pushed off cliffs and beats that were never investigated because that's what poofters deserve. And by the time we got to the 80s, when the riots were starting to happen, uh, the AIDS epidemic kicked in. So we got bashed here. Um, you deserve to be bashed because you're spreading AIDS. And you'll probably, they won't touch you when you're bleeding because you could have AIDS. But what, what, how did it impact the community here regarding the... It was underground. It was all, it basically was underground. I mean, there were bars. Well, what, I, what I'm asking is, it was illegal until just relatively recently. It was illegal until 1984. Okay, so we're looking at, what, 30 years or so. Mm. How did the community change once it became legal? legal? Mm -hmm. I suppose in many ways it didn't. They just did what they normally did. I suppose what changed was some of the stuff that was underground was no longer had to be underground. Okay. Uh, but know, did it alleviate the fears of people? or Were people more I, confident? I do remember the first time someone saying to me, you realise that's the first legal one. I think, oh yeah, it is. So yes, it, it, it suddenly you couldn't go to prison for it anymore. Oh, okay. Still frowned on, you know. How did it impact people that had previously been victimised by that law? Uh, I suppose it was a sense of relief. I know retrospectively various governments have dropped charges against people because okay. some people were given suspended sentences in case they were ever caught again. And those suspended sentences were still on their records, so they still had police records for okay. a crime that was now not legal, it you was know, not illegal anymore. Okay. So a lot of those suspended sentences were dropped eventually. Okay. But we're, to, we're talking probably not to the year 2000 that some of those wow. people still had that sitting on police records that they were being caught having gay sex. It was still on their records. Incredible. Incredible. You mentioned HIV. How did HIV impact your local community? Uh, well, let's face it, the leather part, the leather group were a group who did like to play. Yes. Um, it had significant impact. I mean, I lost, I lost a number of friends in that. Um, I know the television program Pose is on TV at the moment, and I watched that with my other half, who's younger than me. He's a decade younger. And he sees things that he sees, and then I see other things in it. The scene where people are waiting in the ward to get their test results, where they know that if it comes back positive, they're going to die. Now, I've done that. You know, sitting there waiting for the test result. Um, where they go to the, cerem the, the um, cemetery um, and they're buried and no one goes to the wedding because you can get AIDS from the air around a dead person. I've done that. I've done the candlelight rallies. I've done all of that. Um, it really decimated the community. I lost a number of good friends uh, for that. Uh, my only say is my background, I'm a scientist. And I've got, and means part of my degree is microbiology. Thank God. My basic knowledge of virology meant that I played safe. 
Okay. Uh, still filthy, yeah. but safe. Um, and I, I think that possibly saved my life. Uh, simply because there were things I did slightly differently and I lost a number of really good friends. It really decimated the community over here. What were you doing differently? I suppose I was an early adopter of condoms. Okay. Um, okay. But simply there were things involving bodily fluids I no longer did for a while, if okay. that made sense. Look, yeah. At the time yeah. I was working for a public hospital, uh, which is handy, and so I went to the... In, we just had the first person die in Sydney of HIV. And so I went to the in-house service for this, and the person talking about it said, there is no cure, if you get it, you will die, here yeah. are the infection control procedures, you will basically isolate them, you will burn everything, you will allow no visitors. And here I am, I'm in my young um. 20s in the leather, we're just experimenting, and here are clinic, senior clinicians with all of this. It scared the absolute fuck out of me. And so for a while I played quite safe. Tell us how Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and the number 96 impact the community. And for the viewing audience, maybe you'll explain yeah. number 96. Well, number, 90, number 96 is a fairly groundbreaking, of all things, a soap opera, a nighttime okay. soap opera. Okay. And we're talking the 1970s here. So. Um, Australia is still quite conservative here. Like being gay is illegal. Abortion is still illegal. Wow. Um, we had, you know, it's still a relative conservative. And they launched a soap opera, and this is, uh, we believe, the first soap opera in a woman ever exposed her breasts is on wow. here. Wow. This is a prime time television program. They had a gay couple on it who were living together, and it was just. They were a gay couple. It was just normal, normal, mm -hmm. and groundbreaking and revolutionary at the time in terms of normalising this. And they were never shown having sex. In fact, they were never naked because they would be too far. But one of them was a lawyer, and so not only did it normalise it. And this is the first time I can remember seeing a normal homosexual. Okay. Prior to that, you know, they're their sexual deviants, their pedophiles, their drag, and I'm not saying anything against drag, but they're put into movies, you know, I'm talking British comedies, Danny LaRue, you know, those, John Inman on Are You Being Safe. Sure, we're, we're talking sure. either the extremely effeminate gay man or the obviously feral pig leather type person, the typical stereotypes. And so number 96, for the first time, we believe the first to know Bob showed a normal gay couple, one of whom was a respected lawyer, a profession, just fitting in. And it was the first time I thought, I remember thinking it's the first time gay is normal. Wow. If, if that wow. makes sense. It had wow. that. And I'm in my teens, and I still don't know what's happening, but I'm thinking, oh, gay is normal. Yeah. It was how that came along. Um, and then in the 90s, we had a series of films came out of Australia, of which uh, Muriel's Wedding and Priscilla are probably two most famous of those. And Priscilla was shot at a bar, not far from where I lived at the time, a bar called The Imperial oh. in Erskineville. I lived literally up the road from that and used to go watch the drag shows there. Because when you're in the suburbs rather than the city. And I mean, it's, it is the suburbs, but it's the inner suburbs, okay. which, which is alluded to in the movie that it's not out in the suburbia. Um, when you go there, it is a mix of the locals. So you do get, you know, the lesbians, the bears, the twinks, the leather crowd are all in the one bar together, which I think the movie alludes to in the opening scene where you see the whole community in there watching the drag show. Sure. And I remember seeing that and thinking, oh, here's Australian gay going around the world. And in fact, I remember I've been in bars in Chicago and Paris and seen the bar I drink in yes. up, up yes. on the screen. I think, oh, this is my local pub. And here it is on the screen in <laughs> The Eagle in Chicago, which oddly was showing Priscilla. <laughs> that, yeah. But you're... You said you're a sausage judge and a meat inspector. Would you, 
Would you explain that to the, the viewing okay. audience here? The, my, I have a Bachelor of Science in Food Science and Technology. I'm a food safety consultant. I'm, you know, okay. I, I, I own my own business, um, which is why I've got organizational skills. I run my own business. Um, and as part of that, part of my training is I used to work in um, a meatworks. I worked in a, what, a wonderfully named boning room, but worked in a meatworks in the outer suburbs of Sydney. So where I, I was out without realizing because people just assumed you live in the inner city. Uh, so it's assumed you are. Okay. Uh, there was one time I had every fourth Saturday, I had to open the factory on a Saturday morning. And there was one night I'd been to Manacle, a leather bar, and I was dressed as you would be, you know, in black boots, jeans, flannelette shirt, leather jacket, as you do. And it was two in the morning. I thought, oh, I'm not going to go home. So I stayed out to three and drove to work and walked in at, to open the factory at 3.30 in the morning for the four o'clock start. And I just said to everyone, I'm going to be in my office all day. <laughs> and without realizing my street cred did that but oh. also every everyone who didn't think thing he's obviously been out all night so without when i eventually came out because someone asked me how did i enjoy the parade and i said well i was in it it was everyone just expected it so i, I suppose there's that wouldn't have happened in the 70s and 80s i suppose by oh. the time it got into the 90s too. Apart from the fact I'm one of the managers and you can't really tell one of the managers off, by then it was just expected. It, it was just, gay had been normalized to the extent that um, people weren't in the closet as much anymore. So you knew one now. Everyone, everyone, knew, a, everyone knew a gay, to use that wonderful expression they use in Little Britain. Yeah, everyone knew a, a gay somewhere now where my parents' generation, there were no gays. Right. Well, none that they saw no, or well, knew, yeah. They were there, yeah. so just no one was out. But yeah. by, by you get to nine, 1990s, 2000, everyone knows someone. You know, yeah. there, there's someone at work or someone you know socially or there's a relative who's right. now gay. So when you're finally out, it says, oh, yeah, well, it's obvious. And so he lives in the inner city. Yeah. He goes to dance parties. It must be obvious. You know, he listens to Madonna. It must be obvious he's gay. What advice have you for people new to the scene? Um, be yourself. Okay. Yeah, don't think you have to fit in with a norm because there is no norm. The one thing I have learned, the, you know, I always said, oh, I can't be shocked. And then something would happen and I would be shocked. There, <laughs> there, there is no normal. There is no... You do not have to conform. You can be yourself, and you'll find other people like you. Um, okay. th there's a group for anybody. Um, everyone's out there. Uh, you just have. You might have to search a little hard, but God's sake, you're young. You've got the internet. For God's sake, you can find these people these days. I have to look in the back of the classifieds to find these people. Um, don't change. Um, be yourself. What you being yourself is the best. Best bit of you. Don't change to what you think other people want you to be. Now, I, I think some people are going to find very entertaining the fact that you were recently on a, an Australian TV yes. program called Hard Quiz, is that right? Yes, I was. I was on a... And your specialty was the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yes, yes. This is a national quiz program. It's on the ABC, I suppose the equivalent of PBS in the United States or the okay. BBC in London. This is a top rating television program in which you have to go on with a specialty topic. And of course, I went to Rocky Horror all day. I've seen the film over a hundred times. Okay. So I competed on that particular program. It's on national TV. And, you know, I'll wear it. I, I can't wear the leather outfit, but I did wear one of those bright Mexican cowboy shirts, uh, you know, with the scrolls that's electric blue. So huh, I, I okay. went on, I went on in, and if you knew what I was watching, people go, oh yeah, Gary's wearing one of his cowboy shirts oh. on television. And you know, I went on national television talking about Rocky Horror, answering questions on the picture show. How did you do on the program? I made it to the final round. 
I lost in a tiebreaker. Oh. There's, there's no prize. This is a show you go on just to be a smart ass, to show, to show that you are the expert in your topic. And to lose in a tiebreaker was enough to show I obviously know what I'm doing. So this is a, this is a comedy program. You go on there and you get insulted. Oh. And, and it's, uh, you go on there knowing that. It's one of those programs. So you're on there for, an, they film for about an hour and a half and cut it to 25 minutes. And the stuff that doesn't make it to air is foul, 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 foul. I mean, my topic's Rocky Horror. He went for blood on that. But it's all cut out. Very funny show. I enjoy it. I mean, I applied for a TV quiz program. And it's this, with it, there have been other contestants who have done Madonna, Kylie, Dr RuPaul's Drag Race. But someone was on there doing motor car racing, something called the V8 supercars here. Um, he was obviously gay, so it, it doesn't quite fit all the stereotypes. It, the ABC, a bit like the BBC and PBS, because their government really don't care who you are. What's the biggest misconception about you? Oh, um, biggest misconception about me? Um, that, that, that's a really hard question. Um, look, from the leather scene, I suppose the biggest conception about me, because I became president and ran the dance party, that I must be the most feral, foul, hard-playing pig on earth. I can't say I really was. No, I was really into the scene. I really did enjoy before I was married. I really did enjoy that. I wouldn't say I played as hard as some other people played hard. Going the other side, you know, in professionally, um, uh, there are some people who think I'm more learned or conservative than when really I'm not. Um, one, I, I once chaired a conference where my boss made the mistake of saying, make a spectacular entrance to the conference dinner, uh, which is a mistake she never made again. Oh, um, gosh. A, a boss of mine, I'm uh, sorry, a colleague of mine who worked for the same company, he had an ex-police BMW motorbike with the badges taken off, but still, with the, it still looked like a police bike. And so I, borrowed, I lent him one of my policeman's outfits and I hopped on the back of this 1000cc BMW in chaps and harness. Um, we're talking a conservative science dinner and we drove through the dinner and I did a figure eight through the dinner table and then I got up and hosted the dinner in chaps and harness. So I suppose that is, it, got rid of the theory that I was quite conservative. It, it wasn't obvious that I was gay. Addressing a dinner in Chaps and Harness, a scientific conference, pretty much outed me fully. <laughs> Gary Kennedy, thank you no for problem. being part of Inside Leather History of Fireside Chat. No problem. Thank you. Again. Thank you. Thank you.